So far, we've seen neural networks built up of fully connected layers, where every unit in one layer was connected to every unit in the layer before it. In practice, when you build neural networks, you generally try and adapt the shape of the neural network to the kind of problem you're trying to solve. For that, you need special layers. And we'll look at the first type of special layer now, the convolutional layer. This layer was first developed to be used on images, so that's where we'll start. So far, when we've used images, we've, al we've always flattened out the grid of pixels into a feature vector. We did this, for instance, with the MNIST digits in the first lecture and with the eigenfaces in the fourth lecture. With the convolutional layer, we keep the image as a grid, represented as a tensor, and we use the grid to create a layer with far fewer connections than a fully connected layer and far fewer weights. We do this by connecting each node in the hidden layer to just a small n by n neighborhood in the input layer. Here we set n to 2, so every node in the hidden layer is connected to a 2 by 2 patch in the input layer. We do this for every such 2 by 2 neighborhood. So that for a 5 by 5 input image, we get a hidden layer of 4 by 4 units. And we keep the nodes in the hidden layer arranged as a grid also. What's more? We set the four weights of these incoming connections to be the same for each of the 60 nodes in the hidden layer. That means that for all the connections we've drawn here, the layer is parameterized by just four different weights. To extend the hidden layer, we can add additional channels. For every extra channel, we follow the same procedure, but now with four new weights. If, as shown here, we have a 5x5 five five input layer with 2x2 two two pixel neighborhoods and two channels, we get a network with 25 inputs and 32 nodes in the hidden layer. In a traditional feed-forward network, that would give us 25 by 32 connections with as many weights. Here, we have just 32 times 4 connections and only 8 different weights in total applied over these 128 connections. Here's how that looks if the input is one-dimensional, a sequence of units rather than a grid. Note that the connection colors indicate shared weights. That is, every blue connection has the same weight. We call the size of the neighborhood that one hidden unit is connected to the kernel size. One drawback in this picture is that the nodes on the left and right contribute only to one hidden node, whereas the nodes in the middle each contribute to three hidden nodes. This may mean that the information on the sides of our input is more easily ignored. To remedy this problem, we can add padding. Extra nodes added to the input, usually with a fixed value set to zero. Because of this padding, the number of output nodes, the number of output nodes, is now the same as the number of input nodes before we added the padding. And the actual units on the side contribute to more nodes. The padding is usually set in such a way, if our input has multiple channels, like one color channel for each pixel. The standard approach is to add new weights for each channel. Note that these are repeated along the spatial dimension, just like the other weights. The same approach is used to create multiple output channels, as we saw in the earlier slide. Here's the view in two dimensions. We have a kernel, which we can think of as a window of 3x3 three three pixels, and we slide this along the 2D input to create a grid of hidden nodes. We add zero padding to the image to ensure that the pixels on the edge contribute more to the output and to ensure that the output has the same size as the input. And the number of pixels we move the kernel as we slide it along is called the stride. The stride is usually one, but we can also increase it to lower the output resolution. Used in this way, the convolution layer takes as its input a three tensor and transforms it into another three tensor with the same resolution but a different number of channels. The orange box at the bottom represents the kernel extended over all the channels, and the orange box at the top represents eight hidden units, represents eight hidden units to which the elements in the orange box on the bottom are connected. And between these two orange boxes, 
everything is fully connected. Every channel of every pixel in the lower box is connected to every channel of every pixel in the top box. The usual approach is to increase the number of channels as we add more layers. This means that as we get deeper and deeper into the network, the size of the tensor grows. To combat this, at some point we want to reduce the resolution while we increase the number of channels. The standard way of achieving this is to use a max pooling layer. It divides the image into a set of n by n squares, and for each square returns the maximum value within the square. Average pooling, which returns the average instead of the maximum, is also possible, but max pooling is usually more effective. Unlike the convolution, where the kernels overlap in different steps, max pooling is usually used with a stride equal to the width of the kernel, so that we divide the image into a set of non-overlapping squares. The default way of building a large neural network out of convolutional layers is illustrated here. We alternate convolution and pooling layers and increase the number of channels while we decrease the resolution. We apply ReLUs after each convolution and after a number of convolution layers, we flatten the image and add a number of fully connected layers. And these feed into our output layer, which if we're doing classification, is likely to be a softmax layer. Note that since the channels are fully connected, the largest number of weights in this network happen in the end. At the start, we have a lot of pixels, but only very few channels. So due to weight sharing, we start with very few weights. And as we move up the network, we get fewer and fewer pixels, but larger and larger channel dimensions, which are fully connected to the next layer, giving us many more unique weights. In a deep learning system like Keras, implementing a convolutional neural network like this is very straightforward. We simply define a model and add the layers one by one, setting parameters like the kernel size, setting parameters like the number of channels, the kernel size, and the activation to apply after the layer. You may ask what these convolutions actually learn. Here's an example, the Gaussian convolution. It takes a pixel neighborhood and simply averages the pixels in it, creating a blurred result of the input. This is just one of many transformations that a single convolution filter can perform depending on its weights, and many other operations are possible. Now it may seem that Gaussian blur is throwing away valuable information, but what we're actually getting on the right is a representation that is invariant to noise. All of these noisy input images on the left will be mapped to the same input on the right. In this way, the neural network can learn different aspects of the input image and map them to the same representations. Depending on your training task, you may actually be able to look at these inputs and make some inferences about what they are learning to do. In this case, here are the results of a real convolutional network trained to detect faces. The small grayscale images show a typical image that a node in one of the layers responds to with a high activation. Those in the first layer, we can think of as edge detectors. If there is a strong edge in a particular part of the image, then the node lights up. A little deeper into the network, these values are combined into detectors for parts of faces, eyes, noses, mouths, etc. Even further into the network, these detectors are combined into detectors for complete faces. This business is called feature visualization. It's a way of illustrating what sort of things the nodes in your network are responding to. Here's a feature visualization example for a more recent network trained on ImageNet, a large collection of 14 million images with diverse subjects. To find the image on the right, the authors took one node high up in the network, and instead of optimizing the weights to minimize the loss, they kept the weights fixed, and they optimized the input to maximize the activation of that node. This gives us a very abstract image that allows us to see what kind of visual features that particular node responds to. The authors also took the data set and searched for images from the data that caused a high activation in that particular node. And what we see here is that the node responds well to images of beaks and bird faces in general, and that it responds particularly strongly to black birds with red beaks. 
The opposite is also possible. We can search for an input that causes minimal activation. In this case, here we see that the detector for bird faces is minimally activated when it is fed when it is shown images of dogs. These examples are interactive, so if you click the link to go to this article, you can play around with this yourself. So that's convolutions, a type of layer where the input tensor can be thought of as an image, and the output tensor is another image with more channels. It's wired so that output nodes are only wired to nearby nodes in the previous layer, and so that weights are shared, so that each hidden node has the same weights to the previous layer. And generally, we interleave convolution layers with max pooling layers to reduce the image dimensions as we increase the number of channels. Some of the first examples of deep neural networks were convolutional. To train such models, we need a deep learning framework with an implementation of backpropagation, but we also need a number of tricks. It took us quite a while to figure out which combination of techniques was needed to effectively train deep learning networks. In the next video, we'll try and go through the most important ones.